Hello and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Don Krauss and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition. In 1989, our organization was founded as the Shy Drager Syndrome MSA Support Group. And today, and today we're known as the MSA Coalition or the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition. Along with my colleagues, Cindy Romer, our Chairman, Carol Langer, our Treasurer, and Pam Bauer, our Secretary, we will be taking you through the years of the MSA Coalition's development. Hello, I'm Julia Landicho, a nursing major at Union County College in New Jersey. I've been a participant in a STEM research project in which I have been learning about multiple system atrophy. Today, I'm interviewing members of MSA Coalition Board of Directors as together we learn about the history and evolution of this organization that so many of you have come to rely on. Thank you for joining us. Introducing Dr. Tom Chalimsky, Emeritus Board Member who served as a medical liaison for many years, and Don Krauss, Vice Chairman who has served on the board for over 20 years, and Vera James, Emeritus Board Member, longtime member of the community, and a one-time MSA Coalition Co-Chair. So starting with Dr. Tom Chalimsky, as an original board member and a treating physician, can you please summarize how the MSA Coalition has evolved over the years and how it has impacted the MSA community from patients to healthcare providers. Well, I remember back in 19, I think it was 1996 or five that Don Summers uh, asked me to serve on the board. Uh, and I really had not heard of the MSA coalition much before that, except that they had presented some abstracts and that they were always presenting an award. So I uh, enjoyed Don Summers very much and I agreed to serve. And at that time, the only thing the MSA coalition really did was a patient support line and they did a once a year or sometimes twice a year meeting in which all the patients with multiple system atrophy would come from around the country uh, and we would exchange, we would, uh, the physicians would fly down for free, I mean, we would pay for it, meaning that we didn't charge the coalition anything because the coalition didn't have any money. They could barely afford to find the venue, to fund the venue, and then the patients would pay something, and then there would always be a gift from one of the pharmaceutical companies to support the rest of it. And then, little by little, so Don passed the baton, I believe, sometime around early 2000s, maybe mid 2005, something like this, and then the coalition, the name changed. Uh, the name changed from, it was at that time called, uh, I believe it's called the MSA Support Group or something along those lines. And then it became the MSA Coalition and a lot of uh, board members, other board members started to come in. And the coalition suddenly started to grow. So we went from what was really incredibly needed, a patient support venue to become uh, an organization that not only managed to educate patients, but also managed to begin to sponsor research and even was helping in developing some clinical guidelines. So it, it grew from just, I think we might have been four board members at that point in time when Don Summers started it. And it grew from that to, I think there's probably eight or nine board members at this point in time, somebody can specify. and. Uh, there is a whole research activity and a large research fund that is present that wasn't present before. So I think, um, you know, sort of to summarize my view, MSA Coalition started as a mom and pop shop, kind of like Apple in the back of a garage. And it has grown tremendously, not just to support the patients, uh, continues to support the patients, but now at this point supports, supports a whole research endeavor mm -hmm. and also supports uh, beginning, I'd say beginning to support some additional educational endeavors that really are moving the disease forward. So that's, that's kind of a summary of how I see things having changed over the years. Thank you. Um, moving on to Don, can you tell us about the founding of the organization? Sure. Uh, so the organization was founded in 1989 as the Shy Drager Syndrome Support Group. Um, back then, uh, Shy Drager Syndrome was the name for what is now multiple system atrophy. 
It was founded by three individuals, Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury, who was a patient. Her husband had multiple system atrophy. Dr. David Robertson, who is a, a very well-known uh, physician and researcher in the field of MSA. And also Richard Caulfield, who was the vice president of sales and marketing at Roberts Pharmaceuticals, which was the company developing mitogen for the treatment of orthostatic hypotension at that time. As a group, they really felt strongly that there was a, a real need for uh, a, a support group for shy Drager syndrome. Uh, they really recognized that, especially back then, before even uh, many rare diseases were getting any recognition, it was a very lonely uh, and very terrifying diagnosis. So, uh, so they established the support group uh, with the mission of supporting and educating physicians, uh, patients, I'm sorry, supporting and educating patients and caregivers and bringing them together with the MSA experts to help them with education. And what were the most significant accomplishments of the Shy Drager System Syndrome support group during its first 10 years? Okay, yeah, so I think there were probably five key uh, accomplishments during those early years uh, that have really uh, now served as the, as the foundation for what is now the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition. So beginning in 1989, uh, they started with those uh, patient and, and caregiver conferences that I was talking about. Um, they were held each year uh, in the beginning at Vanderbilt Medical Center down in, in Nashville and hosted by David Robertson. And he was bringing in uh, some of his colleagues. Uh, there weren't very many at that time who were uh, experts in multiple system atrophy, but they agreed to also come uh, to the annual conferences. And it was largely uh, David Robertson, Roy Freeman, Horatio Kaufman, and also Philip Lowe, who were the, uh, the main speakers in those early years. Um, and so as, as a group, uh, one of the interesting things that happened out of the founding of, of the conference was that when these physicians were together and just talking among themselves, they realized that there was really a need for an organization for the doctors, a scientific organization. And so the, uh, the American Autonomic Society was, was founded um, during uh, a Shy Drager support group meeting. And for, for the first few years, uh, the meetings were actually held jointly together. Um, so that uh, probably one of the few scientific organizations that was founded as, as an outcropping of a, of a patient support group. So uh, another uh, big thing that is still a hallmark of today's organization was the toll-free hotline. Uh, it was set up initially by Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury, and it actually wasn't toll-free at that time. Patients, she would just give out her home number, and uh, patients that needed help and support, uh, whether it was emotional or, or educational, could just give her a call. Um, and then uh, in, in the mid-1990s, uh, Don Summers, who was a volunteer, uh, his wife had multiple system atrophy at the support group meetings. Uh, he volunteered to take over the toll-free line and established the toll-free line uh, and really uh, set it up what it is today, which is um, you know, really hardworking, dedicated volunteers who demonstrate tons of compassion, uh, answer this toll-free line, and really help people that, that need um, to understand uh, uh, multiple system atrophy and, and how to deal with it. Another uh, big accomplishment uh, was in, in 1988, uh, Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury retired and Don Summers became president of the organization. And he really wanted to see it developed into a, uh, into a structured organization. So uh, beginning in, in 1988, he started the process of getting the organization registered. As, as a nonprofit, uh, which he did in the state of Texas in 1989. And that's when the first board of directors was established. Uh, that included uh, Don, it also included David Robertson, myself, Lynn Woods, Sylvia Dickinson, and, and Dr. Tom Chalimsky, who's on this call with us today. And uh, in 2004, uh, bearing out of work from that early decade, we finally received our 501c3 uh, declaration from the IRS and became the first uh, official tax deductible nonprofit for multiple system atrophy. Two other important accomplishments were the establishment of a website. And this, this is the early day of websites too, back in the, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, but Don Summer's wife, Sylvia, uh, his second wife, Sylvia, uh, also was a dedicated volunteer to the organization. And she created a brochure website for the organization, which was really the first uh, patient centric information for multiple system atrophy uh, on the internet. 
And, uh, and then another uh, accomplishment was the Yahoo uh, mail server, which was the first way for uh, groups of MSA patients to be able to get together and communicate via email. Yahoo no longer uh, stopped supporting that service a number of years ago, but we were able to successfully integrate uh, many of those people into what are now our uh, MSA Coalition Facebook groups. So I think those are the five uh, key accomplishments during that time period. And as I said earlier, they really set the foundation for what the MSA Coalition is today. Thank you. Moving on to Vera, what drew you to get involved with the SDS support group? Originally, my husband was diagnosed in 1989 with MSA, and I didn't have a computer then. So we received a computer in 2000, and I found the Yahoo group that Don uh, Krauss was speaking about. And um, I didn't know Don Summers, but he was always posting on there and giving information. And then uh, in 2003, my husband passed away in that same week. Don called me to see if I would talk to a, a couple that was close and their, their uh, loved one had been diagnosed with it. So I told him I would. And then at the end of that year, I ended up meeting Don Summers. And uh, about four months later, he asked me if I would go and start using a support line in my home. And I told him I would. So it was mainly because people were helping me with questions that I needed when I was first walking this path with my husband. And then uh, I wanted to help others the same way to help them not feel so alone and uh, know that other people understood. And so that's why I got involved with the coalition. And how did the support group help your family during this time period? After, I really got involved with the uh, coalition after my husband had passed away. It was just the few things that I saw Don Summers doing on the Yahoo group where he was giving information and having the conferences and the support line. I did try to call the support line once, but no one answered and I didn't leave a message. So, so I wasn't one that, that used it that way. But um, I, over the years I've had using the support line I, or volunteering to do that 24 seven, I met a lot of patients who have called and we were like a connection, you know, uh, a friend that they could talk to and learn stuff from, you know, and just not feel alone. And most everyone that would hang up, they would say at the very last, you don't know what it's like to find somebody who understands. And I would tell them, yes, I do, I've been there. So I'm just passing on what was given to me, you know, so I've spoke to patients and caregivers all over the world in the 12 years I was answering the support line. And they always, you know, feel like a bond with us. Thank you. With a strong sense of history, the MSA Coalition likes to recognize its early pioneers. In 1989, Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury, along with her family doctor, Sterling Edwards, started the SDS MSA support group with strong support from David Robertson, an outstanding physician from Vanderbilt and an outstanding MSA researcher. David is pictured on the far right and on the far left of this slide. After Dorothy retired in 1989, Don Summers, who is in the left-hand picture, second from the right, became president of the support group and carried on with Dorothy's mission of providing a support hotline and also the annual support group meetings. He also incorporated the SDS MSA support group and formed its first board with members being David Robertson, myself pictured in the middle with the lighter shirt in this picture on the left, with Don Summers and also with Sylvia Dickinson and Lynn Woods. As a tribute to David Robertson and his long career in multiple system atrophy, several years ago, we recognized him for his lifetime achievements, not only with his contributions to the MSA coalition and the support group over many years, but also as an outstanding physician to his patients and a world leading MSA researcher. 
Hi, I'm here with Kara Langer, longtime member of the community and current MSA Coalition board member, holding the position of tre treasurer, and Judy Biedenharm, the Emeritus board member and one-time MSA Coalition co-chair. So, Judy, how did the SDS slash MSA support group evolve during the period from 2000 to 2009? Okay. Well, um, I attended my first um, patient caregiver support group meeting when it was in Ohio, in Cleveland in 2005. So I really cannot address too much what happened earlier than that. Um, my husband passed away in 2003 and I took advantage prior to that of the telephone support line that was answered by Vera James at the time. We became fast friends over the next year or so um, and actually, met in Cleveland at the Patient Caregiver Conference. Um, several of the major accomplishments, I think, was the expansion of those in-person um, support group meetings. And with the COVID virus now, I think, I think I can really appreciate the human contact that we had back there during those um, support group meetings. But we relied a lot on Facebook. We relied a lot on just the internet. Prior to that, it had been mostly telephone calls. But MSA was not well known, and so a lot of the patients did not even know about the support line because the internet was not one of the biggies at that point in time. Um, I actually volunteered for the board at their annual meetings for a couple of years, and then in 2008 was asked to be a board member um, when Nan Todd stepped down. Um, Vera James and I then took over the co-chair of that um, organization when Don Summers passed um, the, the hammer, so to speak, to us. Um, and we just made the contacts. We just kept trying to, to grow and expand. We started um, discussing about a, a scientific advisory board. We talked about enlarging our board of directors from three members and two wonderful physicians, Dr. David Robertson and Dr. Thomas Schlemensky. Um, and just slowly but surely it evolved and some of those aspirations came, came to pass. We um, adopted a new logo. We went from the Shai Drager uh, support group to the MSA coalition, hoping to be more um, recognized globally and not just for the um, small Shai Drager um, emblem that we had been before that. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things probably was the expansion of our board and the expansion of our annual conferences going from about 15 to 20 back in the early 2000s to, I don't know, 150 or plus at our annual conferences now, moving them around to major cities across the United States. So would you say that was one of the major accomplishments during this time? Yes, I, th I think so. Um, the expansion of that plus it was in person and, and that was facilitated um, by the internet too. We were able to quote advertise um, our support group meetings a lot more. Um, and um, back in the early 2000s when I first started going, you rarely saw a patient come more than two years because they were usually diagnosed later and they were unable to travel. Now people are being diagnosed earlier and some patients are coming back the second, third. I think we've had a few that have even been there four years you know, in a row. And I think that speaks highly if people are willing to travel and come to a yearly event um, to learn more and to network with other patients and caregivers. Thank you so much. Moving on to Carol, um, what drew you to get involved with the SDS support group? So my husband was diagnosed in March of 1998, and uh, we literally had never heard of multiple system atrophy before. And so we came home from his doctor's appointment, and um, I sat down at our old-fashioned dial-up AOL internet, 
and um, connected and found exactly two things. Um, one was the NINDS write-up on multiple system atrophy, which was, um, which was really scary. And um, that was how we actually learned that it was a, a fatal disease. Um, and then we also found the, um, the uh, what was then the SDS MSA listserv, which was run by Vanderbilt. And that was a precursor to the Facebook groups. It was an email group. Um, and I signed up for that and realized that if I was going to learn about this, I was going to learn uh, from my peers, from other patients and other caregivers that were going through this along with me. And um, I also, that's how I learned about the, um, the conferences. And we went to our first conference in Cleveland, organized by Tom Chalemsky, um, the organizer of this conference 20 years later. Um, and uh, it was extraordinary. You know, we came away from that. Of course, it was scary and sobering to see some of the people who were more advanced than my husband was. But it was also really energizing and exciting to hear about the research that was being done and hear, and hear the patient's stories and, and, and things like that. So it really got me more involved. And I, I was a very active participant on the listserv back in those days and stayed active when it migrated over to Facebook. Thanks. So how did the support group help your family during this time period? Well, they really gave us the tools that we needed uh, to get through everyday life. Um, you know, when, when things started going haywire, there was always somebody on the other end who, who would say, uh, you know, you, you, would, you would write, you know, like, oh my goodness, you know, he's passing out left and right, what do I do? And it was like, well, make sure he stays hydrated. Make sure, you know, the, the, you can ask your doctor about these meds, watch out for getting him overheated and things like that, that you don't always just immediately think about. So the, the peer to peer um, uh, it, connection was really important and really helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, talk with you today and uh, share with you uh, a few things. I must say, having heard this wonderful team of physicians and healthcare uh, advocates this morning, uh, they have covered so much, including things I hadn't known about until uh, today, that I may not be able to add very much to what you've already heard from them, but I will do my best. I will say a few words, if I can, about this organization. It was established by Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury and then, of course, you met Don a little bit earlier, and they worked very hard for many years to make this work. And one thing that they did that I think almost no other organization of patients uh, I have seen has been able to do is there was not a physician's organization in this field. And this group of people 25 years ago made it happen. And so these are the current people who are leading that, the organization. And just to show you how much things have changed, on the day this was begun, 25 years ago, there were only four physicians who considered themselves to be interested in MSA as a professional interest. And now we believe there are 198 in the United States who do that. So things have changed a great deal. And, uh, this organization had a lot to do with that. Also, the publications, there were only five articles 25 years ago that had been about this. Now, uh, 3,127 articles in the medical literature on MSA. So today I'm here with Pam Bauer, MSA Coalition board member and secretary and research committee chair member. So Pam. The decade from 2010 to 2019 saw major changes for the organization. What were the most significant changes? I think one of the most significant changes was when we changed our name. Our name used to be the Shy Dragger MSA Support Group. And we changed our name in about 2012 to the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition because we wanted to expand, we wanted to expand our mission and go beyond just support to take on higher 
aspirations like funding research. Um, we set up a dedicated research fund where grassroots donors could actually earmark the funds that they donated to go directly to research projects. And we want to increase our education programs for families and for healthcare professionals. And we want to focus more strongly on advocacy work and create more awareness and actually develop partnerships with other charities. And so then we felt the word coalition really fit in with that goal. Um, so another thing that was you know, a, a major change was the number of board members. So we originally had about five board members for, for years and years. And with these, these new, um, this new mission, we felt we needed way more than five board members. So we expanded to 12 members and we set up committees to work on all of these various aspects. Um, all of our board members actually have a personal connection to the disease through a family member or friend. And our board also includes a patient representative. So a, a lady right now, uh, Hadley, she has the disease herself. And we also have a caregiver representative who's, uh, who's very active on the board. And so both of them make sure we're very tuned into the needs of the community and that we're heading in the right direction. We also have set up a panel of advisors to assist us with fundraising and education and support. And to oversee our research grant program, we recruited a scientific advisory board. So these are all established world leaders in MSA research and clinical care. So they make sure that the funds that, that we're devoting to research go to the right research. Um, in the last 10 years, we've uh, really improved our website. We've added a lot of educational resources written or reviewed by physicians who know about MSA. And we expanded our social media presence. And especially Facebook, things really took off when we moved to the Facebook platform. And on Facebook, we focus on provided support, providing support and information through our discussion groups. And um, how have these organizational changes impact the MSA community? Well, we've really seen the community come together around awareness activities and fundraising. So every March, uh, members ask their local representatives to issue proclamations recognizing MSA Awareness Month. So they'll go to their mayor or their governor of their state and they asked for these proclamations. So one of our charity partners is MSA New Jersey, and they spearhead this effort every year. And we work together with the goal to one day, we want to obtain proclamations in all 50 states. I think so far we've gotten over 25 one year, but we haven't quite made that 50 goal. We'd like to do that. Um, the community is also encouraged and even empowered really to tell their personal stories to the press and through any you know uh, online blogs and other social media and this really helps to remove the stigma that exists around having a rare disease and drawing more attention to it from the general public who have absolutely no idea what MSA is and even many doctors don't know what it is and really, we've been overwhelmed by the willingness of the community to set up their own grassroots fundraisers, either with a simple Facebook or classy fundraiser page, which would benefit the MSA Coalition, or some people organize walks and runs, silent auctions. Um, some of these things seem like they might be small, but believe me, they really add up, and we're so appreciative. Thank you, and one last question. What are the major accomplishments of the MSA Coalition during this period? Well, um, back in 2014, we were quite proud that we were able to initiate a federal MSA Awareness Month resolution, which was introduced to Congress. So that was a big milestone that raised a lot of awareness, although it was never officially passed by the Congress, but it was um, introduced so it was read out during Congress and we got some feedback from some Congress people on it. 
Um, they actually retweeted it on Twitter and stuff like that. So we were quite proud of that. Um, through our educational sponsorship program, we were able to revive the International MSA Congress for Scientists, which had originally been taking place every three or four years, then it stopped for five or six years. But we revived that now, and because we sponsor it, it it's been taking place every two years for the past, you know, almost the past decade. Um, we mapped out where we want to be in the next five years with our strategic planning exercise, which took us about 18 months to accomplish. So that was a, a, a big chunk of work. And now we feel we, we know where we want to be. And so we have a plan to move forward. Um, our research, we funded over 40 research projects at 20 centers in 10 countries. And this is a $2 million investment since 2013 and believe me we never thought when we started that we would see a million dollars invested so we had no idea we were going to get such a response from the community with their donations so it's because of the grassroots community that we've been able to fund all this research in the next five years we want to invest another three million and we 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 know we can get that money so and of course if people step up we can do even more um recently we funded five new projects for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we also kicked off an expanded research program focused on bringing groups together to collaborate like around the world to really really laser focus on finding the cause and treatments and you know you know, of those five projects that we've just funded, two of them were for drugs which are already approved for other uses. So this makes a big difference. It could make a big difference for MSA because if it's found that these drugs could help MSA, they'll be able to be approved much more quickly than a drug that's just coming up, you know, an experimental drug that's never been used before. So, so we always try to focus on those sorts of things as well, because we know the need is so urgent for MSA patients. Um, we've been working with other charities that share our goals, and we hosted the first ever global advocacy meeting in 2018. So far, we've developed partnerships with over a dozen other advocacy organizations, as well as partnerships with pharma, companies. And because of our close work with pharma on getting the word out to the MSA community on the global clinical trial for the drug that's called Verdi Perstat, this trial was filled ahead of schedule. And so we're now on the verge of having the first ever disease modifying treatment for MSA approved within maybe a year or two, fingers crossed. <laughs> we don't know. But uh, we feel like we've been getting the word out um, on social media. We've, we're followed by over 20,000 people. And so far this October, we've posted out there about World MSA Day, which is October 3. And we posted about our conference. And these posts were seen by over 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. So we know there's always more work to be done but we do know we're getting the word out and we, we know we're building hope for people who, who tell us all the time that they, they feel that there is suddenly hope for them. They feel the research is being done. They're getting the, more of information that they need and their doctors are getting some of the information as well. So we're quite proud of the work we do and we do know that there's always more to do. We know how urgent it is. Yeah. Introducing Larry Kellerman, MSA Coalition Board Member, Research Committee Co-Chair, and the first caregiver representative on the board. Um, so Larry, what drew you to get involved with the MSA Coalition? I got involved with the MSA Coalition because of the uh, bullheadedness of my patient wife, an MSA patient, Mary Colleen uh, Kellerman. She was bound and determined to go to the 2013 MSA Coalition Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and prove the doctors wrong. She did not have MSA, that was what she said. And within the first 30, 45 minutes after uh, attending the reception, she turned to me and said, um, uh, honey, I know I have MSA now. 
And that started uh, our journey with the MSA coalition. Uh, the next day, uh, the conference was full of information. We got to meet uh, a couple of researchers, one of whom I've been able to maintain contact with through the time. Uh, my wife learned a lot, as did I, and apparently that uh, short time with uh, the members of the MSA Coalition Board, they uh, apparently liked what I showed enough that uh, the following spring they asked if I'd like to run for the first caregiver representative, and I said I would, and was nominated and elected uh, for July 1, 2014. During the time my wife was alive, uh, my goal was to help uh, caregivers uh, who were caring for MSA patients uh, through uh, a daily Facebook page, uh, an MSA coalition uh, uh, login and messages there. I attended the Global Research Roadmap meeting as a member of the advocacy committee and we shared the words of the patients and caregivers who responded to our survey. And then since that time, uh, I've watched another caregiver come in and take my place, Diane Adkins, and her husband passed away and we had Diane uh, or Elaine come on and Elaine Douglas uh, is our current caregiver representative and her uh, partner passed away. Uh, we all care about caregiver patients and we all uh, are even today working together to make uh, life better and um, allow the best quality of life possible for the MSA patient. And how did the MSA coalition help your family during this time period? The MSA Coalition was just wonderful. First of all, uh, they, uh, at the 2014 conference, which was the last one we were able to attend, we attended two in a row, uh, they had uh, the doctors at that particular conference uh, not only do presentations and, and meet in uh, general uh, talks with uh, patients, but also mingle with all of us. And uh, two of the doctors came over uh, to meet me and introduce themselves. And at the same time, I uh, got introduced to Colleen and kind of bent over and started talking to her. And I think you could tell she was a classic MSA uh, case, uh, MSA Sarah Beller. After a short discussion with her and with me, they convinced her to donate her brain following her passing, as well as tissue and eyes. That really moved forward our thoughts about how we can better uh, serve uh, the MSA patient. It's not just uh, helping get through the time of the disease, but it is also helping those who, once they've passed, are able to uh, help other and future MSA patients. So the coalition has provided links to uh, a brain support network that uh, provides those kinds of support. Uh, they've allowed me, uh, a lucky man I am, to work with the research committee and some of the best researchers and most certainly the most dedicated MSA researchers there are. And consistently, I get to meet caregivers and patients daily on the uh, telephone call line. I'm the support line volunteer, and I hear some uh, ser terrible stories. I hear some sad stories, but I also hear some very heartwarming and motivational stories. And that's something that both my wife and I wanted me to do moving forward. Um, so why was it important for you to get personally involved as the MSA Coalition's first caregiver representative on the board of directors? I think the most important thing to me was uh, a statement that uh, Colleen's doctor said to both of us the day that uh, she gave us a diagnosis. She gave us a short synopsis of what we faced. And then she said to me, Larry, you need to realize now that you have to provide for your wife the best quality of life possible. And that became both my motto for my wife and also my life's motto. I know MSA patients and caregivers are going through a journey that is very similar to mine. In some cases, much more uh, stressful, uh, much worse. In some cases, maybe a bit more palatable. And each and every one of them need help and support. And through the actions I take uh, with the board, uh, through uh, opportunities at conferences, and also through this support line call line, I really feel, I feel like it's I'm doing something good for that community. And that to me is more important than any other one thing. Thank you. The MSA Coalition is leading the way to fund collaborative patient-focused research. Since 2013, we have invested over $2 million in 42 research studies in 10 countries. Through these strategic research grants awarded to global scientists, 
we are working urgently to discover the underlying cause, to develop better diagnostic tests, to perform critical laboratory studies, which will lead to clinical trials, all bringing us closer to alleviating symptoms, slowing disease progression, and one day discovering a cure. In addition, we partner with pharmaceutical companies to spread the word about upcoming trials. Check out the MSA research and treatment pipeline pages on our website for more information. Thanks to the tremendous support of you, our grassroots donors and fundraisers, and thanks to generous legacy bequests, the MSA Coalition continues to be the leading nonprofit funder of global MSA research. Advocacy and awareness are important pillars of our mission. On March 5th, 2018, the MSA Coalition was selected to ring the closing bell of the New York City Stock Exchange. For the entire day, the MSA Coalition's logos and colors were displayed throughout the New York City Exchange. And at four o'clock, we rang the closing bell with attendees including from the MSA Coalition, MSA New Jersey, and several patients and caregivers. It was truly a tremendous honor and opportunity to raise awareness. The New York City Stock Exchange informed us that over 1 million people on financial TV networks viewed the ringing of the closing bell that day. Another important initiative are proclamations. With the leadership of MSA, MSA New Jersey and the MSA Coalition, we recruit patients and caregivers and family members from around the United States, North America, and even the world to write their local representatives and, con and, and governors to write proclamations asking for March to be Multiple System Atrophy Awareness Month. We've been tremendously successful with this initiative over the years. Finally, another important day is World MSA Day on October 3rd, which is led by MSA Belgium. The MSA Coalition, not coincidentally, hosts its annual conference near World MSA Day each year and, at, and near the close of each conference, we have a candle lighting ceremony to pay tribute to those who are and have been affected by multiple system atrophy. These are not our own, only initiatives, but they do highlight the work that we do. Hi, I'm here today with Cindy Romer, MSA Coalition board member and current chair and also chair of the conference committee. And Hadley Ferguson, MSA Coalition board member and patient representative. So starting with Hadley, what drew you to get involved with the MSA Coalition? Well, I was drawn to get involved with the MSA Coalition because when I was first diagnosed with MSA, the MSA Coalition website was the first place I looked and it gave me so much valuable information in my early days. I could tell immediately when reading through the website that the MSA Coalition was the most comprehensive place to go for information and it also offered hope with all the research I could see happening. It helped me so much that I wanted to get involved so I could help others who were in my shoes. And how will patients and their families benefit from getting involved with the MSA Coalition? Well, the MSA Coalition provides a great deal of information to patients and their families, both through the website and through annual conferences that they have held. It also offers opportunities for patients and their families to connect with others so they don't feel alone with this disease. If patients and family members decide they're interested in helping with research, the MSA Coalition has funded many projects that people can learn about and potentially participate in. And why was it important for you to get personally involved in the, as the MSA Coalition's patient representative on the board of directors? Well, I am a younger patient and I do feel that my disease process has been slower to progress. And I feel that I have the kind of energy that while I have it, I want uh, to do what I can to help others and share that we are all in this together. I have enjoyed working on the conference planning committee and feel honored to be able to have a patient's perspective represented when we make decisions about topics to discuss and activities for the, for the conference time. Thank you. And one last question. What does the statement, building hope for those affected by MSA mean to you? I think it's a really powerful statement and there's a lot to be hopeful about with MSA. 
There is hope in the research that is happening and will continue to happen to find better treatments and hopefully options to slow the disease process down. There's hope in the dedicated medical teams that treat in patients with MSA. There's hope in the students who are inspired to learn as much as they can so they can treat patients and research on their behalf. And finally, there is hope in connecting with others in the community and inspiring one another as we strive to live our lives to the fullest despite our disease. Thank you. Um, now moving on to Cindy, what are the MSA's coalition's four most important goals? Well, all of us on the uh, board have been touched by MSA in some way, so we have a good understanding of what's needed and that largely drives our goals. First of all, support and education. So our 800 hotline, uh, the listing for the support groups for regional areas, the annual conference, webinars, and other materials. So all the support and education, very important. Standard of care, obviously that's critical. So we're working with organizations identifying centers of excellence and also helping to build interdisciplinary units where patients can go and get treated to meet all of their needs. Research critical uh, as the leading nonprofit having funded research solely for MSA. It's important for us to continue that working off the seed grants that we started and now also with other collaborative efforts. Sustainability um, as a practical measure so that we can continue as an organization so that we can continue to provide these services and programs. And I think perhaps most importantly, community. You know, that we can provide a trusted resource and community where patients can go and, and their families as well to find resources and information and also the opportunity to connect with others who are dealing with this disease. And how do you envision the MSA Coalition evolving over the next 10 years? Well, I think we're going to continue to work off our most recent accomplishments. Um, one is having recently hired a management association company. That's a big accomplishment because it means that now that we have staff to carry out operations so that our volunteer board can really focus on other things like governance, like, you know, determining our priorities to serve our community and to interact with our community, which is very important to us. I think it also speaks to bringing us to a new level because this staff will be able to provide a professionalism in terms of the advocacy and support that we can provide and that will continue to grow over the years you know, as our needs change and they'll be able to address them and really carry out those uh, goals for us. Um, global leadership, we will continue. In 2018, the MSA Coalition hosted the first ever MSA Global Advocacy Meeting. I spearheaded that program and I'm very passionate about it because I think there's strength in numbers. So partnering with uh, other charity organizations across the US and also around the world really helps to give us a louder voice, a stronger voice to accomplish our goals. So by working with established organizations in different countries, they know the unique needs and challenges within their country and their region, but also together we know our shared and common needs so that we can really work together to support the MSA global population most effectively. We also talked at those meetings and in, in the consortium that we're building about sharing research. So we will continue with those efforts as well. And again, the coalition has started those. So we will continue on those collaborative pl plans for patient-centric, coordinated, um, collaborative kinds of research. So we'll have the benefit of the best minds in the MSA field. And of course, getting some critical numbers, which is difficult to do in the rare disease field. So it will really benefit the, uh, the community as a whole. And how will the MSA community continue to benefit from the work of the MSA Coalition? Sure. I think some of those things that I've outlined really speak to that clearly. You know, for over 30 years, the MSA Coalition has been here for the MSA community, led by people touched by MSA. That continues and that really speaks to our, con our commitment um, and that com commitment will not falter. We uh, remain dedicated to providing these services that I've talked about. So again, research, professional development for the medical and scientific community, which is going to benefit the patients and their families as we look toward early diagnosis, better treatment, 
um, education and support, again, to help overcome those feelings of isolation and getting information that you need through the hotline, through support groups, through conferences, through webinars, so that you can be better self-advocates and really um, promote better self-wellness. And of course, um, the global leadership that we can provide bringing together the MSA charities to work together and strengthen and enhance the advocacy. So all of those will bring, uh, bring benefits to the community. Ultimately, look, our goal is for us not to be needed anymore so that we can continue the hope that we all share that one day there will be a cure. Thank you. For over 30 years, the MSA Coalition has provided trusted support and education for its community. Our 800 support line has been staffed by volunteers who have firsthand experience in living life with MSA. Presently, board member Larry Kellerman, pictured here, takes the lead in staffing this call line. Our website provides a variety of educational and support materials, including our guide, MSA, What You Need to Know, the only comprehensive publication of its kind. Additionally, we host multiple social media support pages targeting specific regions and groups, such as patients, care partners, and so on. Our conferences were established early in our history in the 1980s to provide much needed education about this rare disease to patients and their families. Education and support are also important parts of the work that we do. For over 30 years, the MSA Coalition has provided trusted support and education for this community. Our 800 support line has been staffed by volunteers who have firsthand experience in living life with MSA. Presently, board member Larry Kellerman, photographed here, takes the lead in staffing this call line. We also provide comprehensive materials at our website to help provide information for patients and care partners. Additionally, we host multiple social media support pages targeting specific regions and groups, for example, patients, care partners, and so forth. Conferences were established early in our history in the 1980s to provide much needed support about this rare disease to patients and their families. In the early years before the explosion of the internet, internet conferences were small. Nevertheless, professionals in the field shared their expertise with attendees. One of our speakers is photographed there from the 1990s. Our board has always been on hand to provide support as well, seen photographed there with a few guests in 2013. Over the years, the conferences grew, and in 2014, our conferences expanded to include worldwide access through live streaming. At our 2019 conference in Orlando, over 200 attendees joined us in person, connecting with others living with MSA as professionals in the scientific community, not only provided education for uh, our patients and care partners, but took advantage of the time to network and collaborate. Despite the global pandemic, the MSA Coalition continued to offer this valuable education and community event through our virtual conference series, which had over 800 registered, representing more than 30 countries, and had the participation of over 25 community partners in the medical, scientific, pharmaceutical, and charity space. Hi, I'm here today with Dr. Daniel Clausen, MSA Coalition board member, medical advisory council liaison, and Dr. Vic. Karana, MSA Coalition board member and Scientific and Fire Seed Council liaison. Um, for starters, from the perspective of a researcher and treating physician, what has been the MSA Coalition's three to four most significant achievements as encouragers and funders of MSA research? So, Dr. Vic Karana, would you like to start? Oh, I mean, as I, as I think about uh, this program uh, that, that's been so effectively, um, you know, begun and continued by the coalition, I think of, you know, I think of the Research Seed Grants Program. I think this has been a uh, tremendous service to the community, has identified key players in the community, brought researchers who are working in other areas to the, to the field of MSA. Um, I think the seed projects that were funded have now become larger projects that can be, you know, funded by the coalition industry and, uh, and by government. So I think that's given a lot of momentum to the field. Second, I think the coalition has raised awareness. Uh, we still have a long way to go, I think, uh, but the three letters MSA now mean more to more people. I think if you um, go out into the community, you will often find uh, that patients, you know, and, and uh, community members don't 
uh, don't, don't, haven't heard of MSA unless it's touched their family, but I think the coalition is doing a great job in raising awareness. Um, and finally, uh, number three for me is bringing together the key stakeholders, patients, advocates, physicians, scientists, um, and perhaps the greatest achievement in, um, in this regard is the annual caregiver program uh, and conference every, every year that I think brings key people together around the table to discuss important issues. So those are the three things from, from my perspective. Okay, and Dr. Clausen, how has the MSA Coalition improved care for current and future MSA patients? Yeah, well, thanks for, thanks for uh, having me on this um, question panel. So, you know, it's, um, I, David Robertson, uh, when I was recruited here to Vanderbilt, um, told me a lot about the MSA Coalition and even MSA in general. Um, and one of the things that really impressed me about MSA when, when I talked about it with him was the fact that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, MSA was really kind of an, an anomaly. Like, you know, people thought about it, thought it was kind of a, a weird type of Parkinson's or it was a weird type of autonomic problems. And I think, and it, you know, it had a bunch of different names. And so I think the fact that there's now a coalition that focuses on MSA. One of the things it does is for patients and families who are given a diagnosis of MSA, they have somewhere to turn. So they can like get on the website and they can read about it. They can interact with, um, you know, by email or through social uh, media with people from the MSA coalition with other families that are struggling with MSA. And it really kind of helps people feel like they're not, you know, alone in the journey. I think it helps them also get a sense that, you know, yeah, it's, this is a rare disease, but there are other people who have struggled with it. And, you know, I am having this really odd symptom. Can you help me understand it? And there's context for how this kind of gets you know, translated. So I think one of the, you know, it's really, I think it's so important to have a strong MSA coalition. You know, I think it, if, you, if, if we have a strong MSA coalition, um, then we'll be able to, we're going to be able to kind of really focus our efforts, not only on research, but also asking the question, what is the best clinical care for an MSA patient? You know, because a lot of times people do things based on their, their own anecdotes or their experience. But when we start building these kind of larger bodies of clinicians and families and caregivers and patients, we can actually start answering these important questions like, okay, what's the best care for an MSA patient? Um, and, and I think that's the future of the MSA coalition. But I think ultimately, as Vic said, it's given a voice to MSA uh, and that voice is getting louder um, and, and, and kind of a great um, opportunity for patients and families to, to feel uh, not isolated, but part of a larger group of people fighting this disease. Thank you. Um, one last question for either of you to answer. Uh, <clears throat> moving into the future, why is it important for those in the MSA community to support the MSA coalition? Well, I mean, I can start and then I'll hand it over to, to Dr. Klassen. Um, to give his opinion, but I, I would say that um, something we've touched on, I think, before in, in this conversation is that the coalition brings the key stakeholders to the table. Uh, and I think that that's so important, you know, to effectively catalyze conversations among the people who really care about this disease, the patients, their caregivers, advocates, physicians, and scientists. We need a space and a group um, in which, you know, that, that will take you know, the responsibility of bringing us all together. So if, if, you know, I guess the message for me is that if we want to see this disease being understood, managed, treated, and prevented more effectively, we're going to need to have these conversations. And I think the coalition has, uh, has, really, has really catalyzed them and, and done it very effectively. Um, so for me, uh, that really is the biggest uh, reason to, to support the coalition is, is, is bringing people together and uh, for us to have a forum uh, to think of this disease together uh, and really shift the needle on it. So that, that's, that's what I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think, you know, I look at it also from a standpoint of, 
other rare diseases, you know, so if you look at diseases like Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis, um, some of them are a little bit more common than say MSA, but you know, these diseases that have had really big advan advances in, in clinical interventions and cures have a robust uh, MSA community foundation. And I think the bigger that foundation is um, from a monetary standpoint, from a lobbying kind of visibility standpoint, um, from a clinical impact standpoint, i.e. like if you had like centers of excellence that are belong to this community, the better chance you have about advancing uh, clinical research and clinical therapies. And so I think it's really important for the MSA community personally, I think, is to get a stronger MSA coalition that begins to really put a bigger and bigger footprint on um, providing excellence in clinical care, um, uh, education to patients, families, physicians, and research. Um, and I think those are, those are the three things that come up over and over again when you look at different healthcare models of what are the things we should invest in, how should we build you know, our, our, our service to patients. And I think those things make sense to me with the MSA Coalition. So I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, but I think it's really important to, to really support the MSA Coalition to make a bigger footprint. So, you know, one day we can go to say Congress and have a really strong lobbying body, or you can uh, mobilize teams together quickly if you want to test an intervention, or you, if someone has a great idea, you can quickly get feedback from expert scientists and clinicians and understand whether or not, you know, it's something that they could enact quickly. So all those kind of things are important as we build, build a, um, a bigger footprint to try and stamp out uh, MSA. The MSA Coalition supports sponsorships of medical conferences where MSA is highlighted as a topic. Scientists and healthcare professionals are educated about MSA by global experts, including our own scientific advisors. Our board members also network with attendees to spread the word about our organization. Of note is our longstanding association with the American Autonomic Society, which goes back over 30 years. MSA Coalition founder, Dr. David Robertson, is credited with inspiring the formation of the American Autonomic Society and served as their first president. The MSA Coalition is committed to continuing our collaborations with professional neurology and neuroscience societies to ensure that MSA remains on the agenda. Working with MSA scientists and charity partners around the world is an important part of the work that we do. Research plans include a collaborative approach among leading investigators around the world. When dealing with a rare disease, awareness can be challenging. Coordinating with established independent charities who can best serve their respective local communities while supporting common needs of MSA patients and families allows us to share resources to best meet the needs of the global MSA community. And our collective voice facilitates awareness as there is strength in numbers. The MSA Coalition hosted the first ever Global Advocacy Consortium meeting in conjunction with the Sixth International Congress in New York City in 2018. Partnering with the MSA Trust, we moved this consortium work forward and expanded, meeting again virtually as part of the seventh International Congress in February 2021. Between these two meetings to date, nearly 20 charity partners have participated and others have indicated their interest in working with us as we continue to build these global relationships. You can see here our first group in 2018 and our virtual photo here in 2021. It has been truly amazing to see the growth of not only the MSA coalition over the years, but also the MSA community. You can see just from the pictures of our conferences, how our community has grown. With the advent of the internet and with social media growing and growing, the MSA coalition has been able to reach tens of thousands of people, not only in the United States, but around the world. Our group efforts are paying dividends as we continue on our mission to improve the quality of life and build hope for those with MSA. At the very center of what we do is our four pillar mission statement. Uh, I'm not gonna read these to you, you can do that for yourselves, but I will give you a little summary. Uh, the first one is about providing support and we provide both emotional support and comfort and caring to all of the patients and caregivers with whom we interact. The second one is 
about education. We educate um, both our patients, our care partners, and our healthcare professionals with credible, very important, critically information, critically important information, um, which, and we also try to dispel some of the many rumors that run rampant about um, treatments that, that may, may not be effective. We also fund patient-centric research, um, moving towards alleviating symptoms and finding a cure. And perhaps more important than anything, we connect people. We build a sense of community and it is that community that helps us move forward and help other people and raise money to do the research. And um, it is perhaps the most important thing that we do. As I like to say, it takes a village. We're also known for our stability and our transparency. Uh, all of our financial information is readily available on our website. It's also available through GuideStar. Um, we have earned top ratings from all of these organizations, and we're particularly proud to be rated as a 97 out of 100 by Charity Navigator. Charity Navigator does not hand out ratings um, casually. They do their homework. They vet the information that you produce on your Form 990, and we're especially proud that they have um, rated us 97, which is a give with confidence rating. This photo of the MSA Coalition's Board of Directors, along with our Scientific Advisory Board Chair, Dr. Gregor Benning, was taken in 2019 in Orlando, Florida, at our last in-person conference for patients and families held before the pandemic. We hope to bring everyone back together in person once again at our event in 2022. Please stay tuned for details. And our overwhelming, overriding mission is to build hope and enhance quality of life for people living with multiple system atrophy. Every MSA patient deserves to have hope and the very best possible quality of life they can have while living with multiple system atrophy. So that is our story from our grassroots beginning to the organization we have become today. The MSA Coalition has been making a difference for over 30 years. Thank you for joining us on this walk down memory lane. And we hope that our glimpse toward tomorrow offers hope and comfort. For more information about the MSA Coalition, please visit our website at www.msacoalition.org.